With over 19 years of service to the amateur radio community, we are This Week in Amateur Radio, your all-amateur radio and technology news magazine of the air. This is edition number 1001, with a release and air date of Saturday, May 5th, 2018. Please prepare to take the feed to air following the Q-Tone. Welcome. We are This Week in Amateur Radio, North America's premier amateur radio and technology news magazine and bulletin service of the air. Here are the stories that are trending as we come to air this week. The ARRL Executive Committee meets in Windsor, Connecticut. We will have team coverage. An amateur radio enforcement case attracts the attention of the FCC Commissioner. The ARRL is counting down the hours to Hamvention 2018, while the Hamvention organizers are increasing information efforts through social media and texting. The former home of the Hamvention, the Hera Arena, is getting a new owner. Amateurs in Ireland are receiving additional frequencies. We will have a status report on the ARRL official observer program, and NASA has demonstrated that a nuclear fission system can supply power for manned space exploration. These and other headline stories will come to you in a moment along with this week's special features. We'll visit with Bruce Page, KK5DO, and get an update from AMSAT and what's new with all those amateur satellites in orbit. Sitting in for the vacationing Leo Laporte this week, Rich DeMiro will tell us about important changes now available on the Gmail platform. Australia's own Anno Benshop, VK6FLAB, will investigate the mysteries of SWR. Our own amateur radio historian, Bill Continelli, W2XOI, will be here with another edition of Amateur Radio History Headlines. Greg Stoddard, KF9MP, will be here to talk about operating amateur radio while on the rails. And we will feature a before and after talk by Bob Heil. K9EID on the benefits he has seen through his amateur radio hobby. That's all straight ahead as edition number 1001 of North America's premier amateur radio and technology news magazine and bulletin service, This Week in Amateur Radio, takes to the air right now. Reporting from our headquarters studio facility in the area of desolation in Albany, New York, where somebody finally threw the switch and it's spring, I'm W2XBS. And reporting from our news bureau in Armory Square, downtown Syracuse, New York, I'm Chris Perrine, KB2FAF. Reporting from our news bureau in Fayetteville, Arkansas, where spring has... I'm Will Rogers, K5WLR. And reporting from the western Catskills of New York State, where it's now tornado weather, I'm Don Hulick, K2ATJ. 30 minutes of solid amateur radio news begins now. Leading off this week's news, meeting on April 21st in Windsor, Connecticut, the ARRL Executive Committee, or EC, heard a status update on several regulatory matters and the Amateur Radio Parity Act from ARRL General Counsel Chris Imlay, W3KD. Imlay reported that the ARRL continues to work multiple avenues in its efforts to secure passage of the Parity Act. He said the ARRL continues to have solid support from House leadership and most notably from Representative Adam Kinzinger, Republican from Illinois, who Imlay noted has worked tirelessly to see the Parity Act become law. The EC also discussed the FCC's recent notice of proposed rulemaking regarding the deployment of small satellites by colleges, universities, and commercial entities using experimental licenses on amateur radio spectrum. The EC was told that the International Amateur Radio Union has changed its previous policy regarding the coordination of small satellites called CubeSats and that the FCC policy is overly restrictive in some respects and insufficiently protective against commercial exploitation of amateur radio spectrum in other aspects. AMSAT has requested ARRL's input. The EC agreed that ARRL's comments should reflect our support for World Radio Communication Conference 2015, Resolution 659, and IARU policies. 
In addition, the ARRL will, one, support and encourage college and university amateur radio experiments, where the sponsor of the experiment is an amateur licensee and all operation is in amateur spectrum, and two, will discourage commercial or Part 5 experimental operations using amateur radio spectrum. The EC asked Imlay to file ex parte comments in support of petition for rulemaking RM-11775 relating to frequent changing of vanity call signs and to file ex parte comments on the ARRL's petition for rulemaking RM-11785 noting that the Canadian government has implemented a new contiguous 5 MHz band and permitted a power level of 100 watts. The EC also requested that Imlay support a request by certain ARRL members for an STA or experimental license for higher terrestrial and EME power levels in the 76 to 81 gigahertz band to permit amateur radio experimentation. The EC asked Imlay to share with the National Telecommunications and Information Agency, or NTIA, ARRL's concern regarding an NTIA study to use 3450 to 3550 MHz for mobile wireless applications. That includes a portion of the 9mm amateur radio band. The EC also instructed Imlay to prepare and circulate for review comments regarding ARRL policy on a plan to make spectrum above 95 GHz more readily accessible for new innovative services and technologies. This could impact primary amateur radio allocations of 134 to 136 GHz and 248 to 250 GHz. Comments would include a request for prior coordination of experimental licenses in the millimeter wave bands with the ARRL. Our team coverage of the ARRL Executive Committee meeting continues with Will Rogers, K5WLR. In other business at the recent ARRL Executive Committee meeting, ARRL Atlantic Division Vice Director Riley Hollingsworth, K4ZDH, the new chair of the Amateur Auxiliary Study Working Group, reported via teleconference that he'd met with the FCC's Laura Smith concerning implementation of an updated and improved official observers program. Several attorneys have reviewed the ARRL's draft memorandum of understanding and several commission attorneys who have reviewed the new manual for OOs will be providing feedback on the proposal. Once the FCC's comments are received and addressed, the working group will present its final report and recommendations to the EC, which will make a final recommendation to the full board. After lengthy discussion, the EC directed CEO Barry Shelley, N1VXY, to work with the Amateur Auxiliary Study Working Group and headquarters staff to update the full board and membership on the status of the Amateur Auxiliary Program and potential changes. In the interim, the ARRL field organization may resume making a limited number of OO appointments. Concerning ARRL governance, the EC discussed a wide range of options to most effectively update ARRL's Articles of Association and bylaws and to bring proposed additions or revisions to the full board for its consideration in July. The board in January adopted new Articles 15 and 16 to make the language of the Articles of Association consistent with Connecticut Nonprofit Corporation statutes, but filing these with the state was postponed for additional fine-tuning. Article 15 addresses the issue of personal liability on the part of directors, vice directors, volunteer officers, and staff officers regarding breach of duty in their respective roles, provided the breach did not involve a knowing and culpable violation of law, improper personal economic gain, a lack of good faith, and conscious disregard or sustained and unexcused pattern of inattention amounting to abdication of duty. Article 16 would indemnify directors, vice directors, volunteer officers, and staff officers for any action taken or any failure to take action with conditions similar to those spelled out in Article 15. Changes to the Articles of Association would add the organization's informal name, ARRL, the National Association for Amateur Radio, to Article 1 in accordance with Connecticut statutes. A proposed change to Bylaw 23 would clarify the schedule of director elections. 
Pursuant to action at the January board meeting, the EC reached consensus to develop a revised policy on board governance and conduct of members of the board of directors and vice directors, or its code of conduct, using a template from the National Council of Nonprofits and an edited version of the current conduct code. An ad hoc committee was formed to draft a proposal to be presented at the fall executive committee meeting and subsequently to the full board. ARRL will publish white papers to explain all changes to the Articles of Association, bylaws, and code of conduct in advance of the July board meeting. International Affairs Vice President Jay Bellows, K0QB, discussed several IARU issues, including worldwide harmonization of six meters. The IARU also is evaluating the potential for disruption of amateur frequencies by low-frequency remote power charging systems, as well as band planning issues related to the new FT8 protocol. ARRL Delta Division Director David Norris, K5UZ, updated the EC on the progress of the ad hoc working group that's reviewing board advisory committees. Norris expressed concern that, over the years, advisory committee chairs have neglected to provide feedback evaluations to the board on the activity and participation of their appointees. The ad hoc working group is exploring options to improve advisory committee structures and procedures. And in one final item, the executive committee approved 192 new ARRL life members. You're listening to North America's premier amateur radio and technology news magazine of the air. We are This Week in Amateur Radio, distributed worldwide at TWIAR.net. FCC Commissioner Michael O'Reilly has used the latest chapter in an amateur radio enforcement proceeding to reiterate his call that the Commission abolish its Administrative Law Judge, or ALJ, system. With more details on this late-breaking story, we go to Carla Pereira, KC1HSX at League Headquarters, who files this report. The long-standing case involves efforts by William Crowell, a W6WBJ of Diamond Spring, California, to renew his license. Late last week, the FCC denied reconsideration of Crowell's petition to have the Commission assign a new administrative law judge to his case. Crowell argued that the current judge, Richard Sipple, is biased against him. Attaching his own comments to a memorandum and opinion order released on April 26th, O'Reilly said he approved the Commission's opinion that Crowell's appeal was justifiably denied, but he expressed concern that the judge took unnecessary actions in Crowell's case and in another unrelated proceeding. It has been 10 years since the FCC set Crowell's license renewal application for hearing and nearly as long since Crowell requested disqualification of the judge assigned to his case. Crowell's license renewal hearing centered on whether he had violated FCC Part 97 rules by intentionally interfering with and or otherwise interrupting radio communications, transmitting one-way communications, indecent language and music, and whether he is qualified to be and remain a commission licensee and have his renewal application granted. In 2016, the FCC imposed a $25,000 fine on Crowell for intentionally interfering with the transmissions of other radio amateurs and transmitting prohibited communications, including music. The penalty included an upward adjustment reflecting Mr. Crowell's decision to continue his misconduct after being warned that his actions violated the Communications Act and the Commission's rules, the FCC said at the time. Crowell's license, which expired in 2007, has not been renewed, but Crowell may continue to operate while his renewal application is pending. I'm Carla Pereira, KC1 HSX. On a larger scale, complaints about the ALJ process are not isolated incidents, but paint a picture of questionable decisions coupled with an elevated level of inefficiency, O'Reilly said. It seems to me that, too often, the Commission has led to reverse itself the decisions of the ALJ or address one ALJ decision or another. This reality only reaffirms my call to consider eliminating the ALJ process altogether, said O'Reilly. The penalty represents the full amount proposed in a December 2015 Notice of Apparent Liability for Forfeiture, or NAL, and the FCC said in an August 2nd forfeiture order is based on a full base forfeiture amount, as well as the upward adjustment reflecting Crowell's decision to continue his misconduct after being warned that his actions violated the Communications Act and the Commission's rules. 
Mr. Crowell does not deny he made the transmissions that prompted the NAL in this proceeding, but argues in large part that those transmissions were protected by the First Amendment of the Constitution, the forfeiture order said. We have examined Crowell's claims of bias in accordance with our precedent, a task made more difficult because Crowell provides virtually no detailed factual support or references to the record of his allegations, the FCC concluded in this month's Memorandum of Opinion and Order. Hamvention 2018 will be held on May 18th through the 20th at the Greene County Fairgrounds and Expo Center in Xenia, Ohio. It is the largest annual amateur radio gathering in the United States and sanctioned as the 2018 AWRL Great Lakes Division Convention. AWRL Expo, a large exhibit area in Building 2 called the Tesla Building, will serve as the hub for AWRL activities, booths, and program representatives. More than 90 team members will support AWRL Expo, including 18 headquarters staffers. Recent additions to the AWRL Expo guide include schedules for the ARRL stage and meet the author's table. Hamvention's theme this year is amateur radio serving the community. The ARRL will reflect that spirit by sponsoring four forums on Friday and Saturday that will comprise a public service communications track. Convention goers attending three or more AWRL sponsored public service communication forums will earn an ARRL certificate in recognition of their commitment to ham radio public service training and development. At the always popular ARRL membership forum at noon on Saturday in Room 3, Great Lakes Division Director Dale Williams, WA8EFK, will share an update on proposed new guidelines for amateur radio emergency service volunteers. He'll also discuss plans for a new volunteer management software system, Ares Connect. Williams is leading a team that seeks to upgrade Ares training and ensure the service continues to be a valuable partner for its served agencies into the future. The Dayton Daily News is reporting that a Louisville, Kentucky-based developer, Michael Heights, of Garrett Day LLC Properties is in the process of buying Hara Arena, which served as home to Dayton Hamvention from 1964 until 2016. Heights told the Dayton Daily News that he bought out income tax liens on the property from Montgomery County and is hoping to close on some bank liens later this week. It's not known how much Heights has invested in the property so far. The six-building Hara Arena Complex includes some 120 acres of real estate, 25 acres alone devoted to parking. Heights said his priority is to clean it up and secure the property. Hara Arena has been visited by camera-carrying urban explorers as well as by vandals since it closed. The IRS put the Hara Arena complex on the auction block last August to satisfy a tax lien, but no successful bidder came forward. An IRS staff member who was involved in the 2017 auction told ARRL early this year that the agency would not try again to auction the parcel, but suggested that other lien holders, including a mortgage holder and the town of Trotwood, might go that route. At one point, the asking price for Hara Arena was $775,000. The Dayton Daily News reported in March that Hara property owners' trustees owed back taxes and around $350,000 to banks. Heights is known for buying distressed properties and getting them shovel-ready. He plans a Monday news conference to discuss the purchase and his plans. According to the Dayton Daily News, Heights has purchased other properties in the area by buying up tax and property liens, and his reputation for buying up derelict properties and turning them around goes back several years. A former West Virginia University basketball player and distance cyclist, the Seven Foot Hall Heights is said to be a fearless investor. The Wampler family had owned and operated Hara Arena since its humble beginnings in the 1950s when Wampler Bell Arena then a dance hall and later an exhibit hall, familiar to Hamvention visitors, was built in what had been a family-owned orchard. When Hara closed in August 2016, the estimated economic hit to the Dayton area was said to be $36 million a year. Visitors wanting up-to-date information while traveling to or attending Hamvention are encouraged to take advantage of text alerts made available this year. 
The alerts will share important weather, traffic, parking, and other information throughout the weekend of the show. To subscribe to the system, users should text HAMVENTION18 to 888777. HAMVENTION has credited Greene County Sheriff Gene Fisher, KX8GCS, with making the alert system possible. The alert system is the latest addition to HAMVENTION's efforts to disseminate important visitor information. For many years, HAMVENTION has had a talk-in station on the Dayton Amateur Radio Association repeater at 146.94 MHz, 123.0 PL tone to give directions and other assistance. A traffic bulletin board station has been added on the 145.525 MHz frequency to periodically repeat needed information. The text alerts and the talk-in and traffic bulletin stations will all share information about road conditions, accidents, and other incidents, detours, parking status, and other news and information. Hamvention General Chairman Ron Kramer, KD8ENJ, has said that all three efforts should help make arrival and parking more efficient. Talking station operators can also provide directions to anyone who might have missed a turn or otherwise need assistance. During Hamvention this year, hourly prize winners will be posted on Twitter as soon as possible, as well as displayed on monitors throughout the fairgrounds. Following Sunday's grand prize drawings, winners will be posted on Twitter and on the Hamvention website's prizes page. We are This Week in Amateur Radio, your amateur radio and technology news magazine of the air. On June 23rd and 24th, Amateur Radio will celebrate Field Day 2018. This is Ham Radio's open house, featuring demonstrations of the science, skills, and service that is Amateur Radio. Hams from across North America will hold local field day events to display the array of equipment and technologies they use for public service and community outreach. For more info, visit ARRL.org slash field dash day. I'm Steve Ford, WBAIMY, and this is the propagation forecast for Friday, May 4th. There are no spots on the sun at the moment, so the solar flux index has dipped to about 68. With that in mind, if you plan to take part in the Indiana, Delaware, New England, or 7th Area QSO parties this weekend, you'll probably rack up your best scores below 14 megahertz, especially at night. There's a stream of solar particles due to arrive over the next couple of days, and that's going to make 40 and 80 meters even more attractive since geomagnetic disturbances may seriously disrupt the higher bands. On VHF and UHF, California is the place to be for band openings over the next couple of days. However, hams in northern Florida and South Carolina should be on the lookout as well. And now with this week's satellite update, here's Bruce Page, KK5DO. Now and then the question comes up, what is the best satellite tracking program? Of course, it depends if you are using a Windows-based computer, Linux, or Mac. It also depends on what your perception of the best GUI is. A few of the programs you can take a look at are SAPPC32 for Windows, GPredict for Linux or Windows, or possibly Mac Doppler for the Mac. A quick Google search will come up with each of them and the opportunity to try them free of charge. Then comes the question of the best logging program for satellite operations. We have some special needs as we have to indicate which satellite we are using as well as one, two, or four grids for the contact. This would be an entire hour to run through many of the more popular programs. Do a little research and see which one will work best for you. Even if you're operating from home and only one grid, the station you might be working could be on a double or a quad grid boundary. This is Bruce Page, KK5DO. Are you ready for another trip into amateur radio history? I'm Bill Continelli, W2XOY, and I'll be back in a moment with another edition of the Ancient Amateur Archives here on This Week in Amateur Radio. In December 2015, Comreg, Ireland's regulator, published a draft radio spectrum management strategy 2016 through 2018. The society responded with a comprehensive submission to this draft, and a summary of this was published in the March 2016 edition of Echo Ireland. In June 2016, Comreg published its final radio spectrum management strategy 2016 through 2018 and indicated its intention to grant some additional spectrum to the amateur service. 
This has now been done and is in line with some of the requests made in the Society's submission. The 70 MHz band has been extended to 69.9 MHz to 70.5 MHz. This is an increase of 275 kHz over the existing band of 70.125 to 70.450 MHz and is the full band that may be allocated to the amateur service under the European Common Allocations Table. Further spectrum covering all modes including digimodes has been granted on a secondary basis at 30 to 49 MHz and 54 to 69 MHz. The latter band also includes digital television in addition to all other modes. These new frequency bands are listed among the bands available generally to radio amateurs in Annex 1 of a recently revised version of the Amateur Station License Guide document Comreg 9-45R4, which is available on the Comreg website. The new bands in the 40 MHz and 60 MHz region will, among other things, facilitate modern type beacons in the region of these frequencies as well as moving the existing 70 MHz beacon on 70.130 MHz to the section of the band designated for beacons. IRTS, the Irish Radio Transmitter Society, will be producing a local band plan for these two bands in consultation with countries that have allocations of these frequencies and the IARU. The Society would like to express its appreciation to Comreg for the release of these extensive spectrums to the amateur service on a secondary basis. This is Bill Continelli, W2XOY, with Amateur Radio History Headlines. 1983, A Ham in Space, Owen Garriott, W5LFL becomes the first amateur to operate on board a space shuttle. He makes hundreds of QSOs on two meters. Another code-free license idea pops up. Amateurs are overwhelmingly opposed and the proposal is dropped. 1984, the 10-year license replaces the five-year one. The FCC stopped giving examinations, turning the duty over to the new volunteer examiner program. The HF phone bands are expanded and the amateur population is up to 410,000. 1985, state and local rules which restrict amateurs' antennas must now comply with the FCC's new policy expressed in PRB 1. The FCC gives itself preeminence in antenna regulations and states that local ordinances must provide for reasonable accommodations regarding amateurs' antennas. This has been Amateur Radio History Headlines with Bill Continelli, W2XOY, for this week in Amateur Radio. At its most recent meeting, the ARRL Executive Committee directed the ARRL Headquarters staff to resume accepting a limited number of appointments to the Official Observer or OO program as necessary and where needed under the current rules and standards. In 2015, following the FCC's decision to reduce the number of its field offices and field agents, the Executive Committee of the ARRL's Board of Directors authorized a review of the OO program. At that time, the FCC had approached the ARRL about revamping its OO program to create a more efficient, highly trained group that could assist the FCC in its efforts. Anticipating a much quicker resolution, the working group for this project decided to suspend new appointments of OOs and OO coordinators until the new program, with its expected new requirements and regulations, was put in place. The group did not anticipate the length of time it would take to bring the proposal through the approval and implementation process. It should be noted that even during the time period when new appointments have not been made, the more than 700 existing OOs remain on the job and the OO program remains in effect. During this extended period, concerns have been raised from the ARRL field organization about existing vacancies in the OO program. As a response, the Executive Committee feels that a limited number of appointments should be allowed at this time. Even with this action, any new OO appointments are being made with the understanding that a new program is coming with new requirements and new standards for OOs. 
For more than 90 years, the ARRL Official Observer Program has aided thousands of amateurs in maintaining their transmitting equipment and keeping their operating procedures in compliance with FCC regulations. The OO program, as part of the Amateur Auxiliary, has been working directly with the FCC's Enforcement Bureau since the mid-1980s. High standards of operation benefit the entire amateur radio community, and everyone's continued cooperation is appreciated. A radio amateur and Puerto Rico Air National Guard member involved in hurricane recovery died May 2nd when a Hercules C-130 aircraft crashed in Georgia, killing all on board. Among the nine fatalities was Eric Circuns, WP-4OXB of Rio Grande, Puerto Rico. The cargo plane attached to the Puerto Rico Air National Guard's 156 airlift wing went down shortly after takeoff while on a routine mission to Arizona. Eric has been part of this unit and this aircraft has served during both Hurricanes Irma and Maria. A RRL spokesperson and assistant director, Puerto Rico SM Jose Otis Vincennes, NP4G, said in a statement, the people of Puerto Rico thank him for his service and ultimate sacrifice. He will be remembered. According to media accounts, the 60-year-old aircraft was under repair in Savannah before it took off. It had been used in several hurricane relief and recovery efforts and was reported to be on its way to Arizona to be decommissioned. We are This Week in Amateur Radio, your amateur radio and technology news magazine of the air. And now with the latest technology news and commentary from Petaluma, California. This Week in Amateur Radio is proud to present Leo Laporte. Leo is on vacation, so in his place is yours truly, Rich DeMuro. I'm the tech reporter for KTLA 5 News in Los Angeles. Leo, like I said, is on vacation, so uh, we'll just have fun in his place. I'm in his uh, beautiful studio here. And believe me, he gets a lot done from one seat. Let me tell you, I'm going to try to replicate as much of that as I can. Do you guys like change? You know, I'm talking about like when you get used to something, do you like when it changes? Well, that's exactly what's happening to Gmail. This was the big news this week that Google is giving Gmail a revamp. And I remember when Gmail first launched, it was April 1st. 2004. And the reason I remember that, I didn't remember the exact year, but I remember the exact date. I was working as a reporter in Shreveport, Louisiana, and I remember being so excited for this new email product, new web email. And why was I so excited? Because at the time, your best bet for webmail was AOL, Hotmail, or Yahoo. All of them offered a measly amount of storage. I think maybe Yahoo offered the most. I know Hotmail had about two to five megabytes, not gigabytes, megabytes. And there was a time when you got your email and you actually had to clear out your inbox because there was just too much in there. And Gmail comes along from Google, this small little company that was sort of taking over search on the web. And next thing you know, they're like, we're giving you a gig just to start and counting. And they changed the entire way you looked at your email because you never had to delete anything. You would archive something. In fact, finding a delete button at that time was nearly impossible. You just pressed archive, which I hated, by the way, because when I got a newsletter or something I did not need anymore after I was done reading it, I wanted it deleted. So you could delete, but it was not that easy. Anyway, fast forward a decade, or gosh, 14 years now, Gmail is used by over a billion people worldwide, probably one of the most popular products for Google. And now they're changing it up. They are giving it a revamp with a bunch of new features. So let me go through some of these new features that are available now. I've already switched over. You don't have to, but as a tech nerd, of course, I want these things immediately whether I like them or not. And there's some things I like, some things I don't. The biggest, basically, if you've used what's called Inbox by Gmail, that's kind of what they used as a model. I think they took some of the best features from that. I personally did not like Inbox, did not work for my workflow, but a lot of people do. And I think they use some of those features to kind of come up with the new Gmail. Number one, when you're looking at your Inbox now, if anyone has sent you a file or a picture, it's going to be right underneath the message. So you don't have to actually click inside the message to see it. This is very handy because sometimes if you exchange something back and forth with someone for maybe, you know, 10 messages and you said, hey, what's that file? Can you send that to me? 
And then when you go to look for that file or that picture or whatever, you have to go back and look through all the messages and all the attachments to find it. Now it's just front and center right on your home screen, which is really nice. Arguably, the biggest change is now the snooze button. So if you don't want to respond to an email right away, you can now hit this snooze button on the email. And your options for snoozing are later today, tomorrow, next week, next weekend, or someday. Or of course, you can pick a date and time. Now you might think, oh, that's a procrastinator's dream to have a snooze button. Well, it can be actually very useful. So for instance, for me, the way I do most of my email is kind of a triage. So I go through my inbox and I like inbox zero. So I go through and I kind of triage the emails. The ones I need to reply to, I reply to. The ones that can wait, I kind of leave in there and they linger. With this snooze, I can now snooze things until the next day because mostly I check my email in the morning, the most when I'm replying, but in the afternoons, it's kind of like just on an emergency basis. Not emergency, but if it's a real, um, if it's an email that needs to be replied to, I'll reply. So now I love the snooze. And uh, as I say this, Monday morning is coming up tomorrow. There will be a lot of emails reappearing in my inbox at 6 a.m. on Monday morning. Nudge to reply is another new feature, which is really neat. So this will look at your emails and kind of wonder what happened to you. So for me, a lot of times I'll talk back and forth with someone and then I'll ghost them basically, not intentionally, but I just kind of forget. And so now Gmail will realize that and say, hey, um, you know, you were talking to this person and you kind of just left them hanging. Why don't you reply to that email that you stopped replying to five days ago? And that's another one, nudge to reply. Another favorite of mine that is on mobile right now that is coming to the desktop is smart replies. And this is kind of mixed. I think sometimes it works brilliantly, sometimes it doesn't. But Gmail sort of looks at your messages. A machine will read the contents of them. Yes, a machine is reading your emails. And artificial intelligence will suggest three simple replies. So let's say someone says, hey, can you do lunch Friday at noon? Now, normally you'd have to think about that. Look at your calendar, come back, write stuff. Well, the smart replies will say, sure, that sounds great or something to that effect. I can't do noon. How about 1 p.m.? Okay. Or no, I can't do that. Now, I'm just making those up. I don't know what it would actually come up with, but those are the types of responses. And a lot of times you'll just get responses like, sure, that sounds great or awesome or sounds great. Can't wait to see you then just super simple things with one tap you can send back to someone. Now, these aren't life-changing, but it saves you a bunch of keystrokes, especially on your mobile device. Now, when you have this on desktop, it works kind of well too. So right now, I just got an email from someone and the three replies are, yes, I'm still interested. Yes, I am. Sorry, I'm not. And I love these, but I feel bad using them because I am basically letting a robot reply to my friends and colleagues when they email me. And I feel sort of bad doing that, but it is highly efficient. And I'm a huge fan of that. But I also think it's kind of weird that a robot is taking over um, my personality because some of the things it comes up with, I wouldn't necessarily say it in that way, but it works. And so there's my reply. One thing I really like is, uh, there's a couple more features, like confidential mode, which is uh, if you have a sensitive message, you can set it to self-destruct. You could also make it so people can't forward, copy, or download, or print the message. But keep in mind, someone could always take a snapshot of the screen or a screenshot. So that, to me, is giving people a false sense of security. I don't think that's going to be used as much. There's also easy unsubscribe a new tasks app. And one thing that I've really wanted for a while on my main Gmail screen now, I can see my tasks, my calendar, and also my notes all on one screen. And there is also a tasks app that's new for iOS and Android that you can download. You can get the, the, all these features right now. If you go into your Gmail, press the little settings button and it says, try the new Gmail. And if you don't like it, you can go back. But... There will be a point, according to Google, where you will have to take these new features in the new Gmail. I'm loving them, and I'm, gonna, I'm a person who did not like Inbox, and I'm, I'm okay with these changes. I will say the only thing I don't like so far, by the way, is the fact that the delete button shifts around whether you have an email open or an email closed. 
We are This Week in Amateur Radio, your amateur radio and technology news magazine of the air, available online at www.twiar.net. Ruth Willett, KM4LAO, a 19-year-old student at Michigan's Kettering University, has received the Radio Club of America's Young Achiever Award. The RCA Young Achiever Award is presented to a student of high school age or younger who have demonstrated excellence and creativity at wireless communications and who have delivered a presentation at the annual RCA Technical Symposium. Receiving the award allowed her to attend the International Wireless Communications Expo held in Orlando in early March. I was shocked to have received this award. I never dreamed I would be able to attend such a prestigious wireless event, Willett said in an article for Kettering University News. It was an honor being recognized by the Radio Club of America and to be presented with this award. It was an eye-opening experience for me to be exposed to the field of wireless communication and to be introduced to discussions taking place among first responders and the government regarding emergency situation preparedness. Willett, who is from Lawrenceville, Georgia, is the recipient of the AWRL Rocky Mountain Division Scholarship. At Kettering, she is pursuing a double major in mechanical engineering and engineering physics. She is president of her school's recently revived amateur radio club, GMTE, Amateur Radio and Electronics Club, K8HPS. As an amateur radio operator, I've mostly only experienced the hobby side of radio, Willett said. This conference allowed me to see a broad range of applications for radio and technology. It was very energizing to attend all sorts of workshops and seminars and learn how much our daily lives are touched by the field of wireless communications. This award is not Willett's first recognition in the world of ham radio. Last spring, she was the keynote speaker at the 32nd Annual DX Dinner, held in conjunction with Hamvention, where her topic was experiencing the hobby of a lifetime. She also spoke at the 30th Hamvention Youth Forum in 2017 on plugging into your valuable club resources. The previous summer, she was a member of the 2016 Dave Coulter Memorial Youth DX Adventure Trip to the Dutch Caribbean island of Saba, and her article about the experience won a QST cover plaque award. I'm Greg Stoddard, KF9MP on the rails, reporting for This Week in Amateur Radio. These days, more and more people are deciding to take the train instead of flying the crowded skies with their cramped, uncomfortable seats, crazy drunk people, or being treated like a criminal at the airport. This becomes especially true when people realize that the trip itself can also become a part of the destination. At the airport and on the airplane, using electronics like a GPS, VHF scanners, and sometimes even your laptop computer can be forbidden or even seized. So what about using ham radio or other wireless electronics on board a long-distance passenger train? You can probably visualize that modern passenger rail cars are highly electronic and operate many high amperage AC circuits inside. On the outside, trains often share their rail right-of-way with very high-voltage noisy power lines running alongside the tracks mile after mile. The RF environment inside the Amtrak cars tends to be as noisy as inside any modern-day American home. These grounded stainless steel train cars attenuate outside signals and serve as directional barriers to RF and can also tend to keep radio noise safely inside the car but I was still able to listen to AM and FM broadcasts with my tiny HD, and I could work two meters simplex and some repeaters just fine from inside the sleeper car. The modern Amtrak cars are often two stories tall, which gives you a definite height advantage over working from your car. Using my tiny HD as a scanner worked better than I expected. Rail companies in the USA have their own band from 159 to 162 megahertz divided into about 100 channels every 15 kilohertz. They use analog narrow FM for voice and also some telemetry beacons. They also use a special gear on higher bands like 220.1 and 452 megahertz and in the realm of cellular from 826 to 928 megahertz but most of these are for data and telemetry. On a recent Amtrak trip, I found most of the crew using FM handhelds. 
Most of the larger rail stations used FM simplex following the same channel schemes I found online. You can program all 100 rail channels into your HT and follow most of their voice traffic. Listening to the dispatchers at the larger stations provided a good source of information about work being done on the train cars, causes of delays, or possible traffic conflicts up ahead. Rail employees have their jargon just like in aviation, and it was interesting to hear them use the readback method to make sure that instructions from the dispatchers were correctly received. Amtrak does not own the tracks they run on, but shares them with a host freight company that actually own and maintain the rails, which means passenger service sometimes has to park and wait for the freight traffic to clear. This also means Amtrak is operating a passenger service on a rail network designed for freight trains who probably don't care about how smooth or quiet the ride is. It also means that delays are generally well communicated by radio from the conductor to the dispatchers on one of those 100 VHF channels, so you'll be well informed about the delays and that most commonly asked question, how long till we get there? On my two and a half day rail adventure, I was the only passenger that knew the actual cause of some of our delays, which are common for Amtrak service, so they're very upfront about them. If you search online for Amtrak radio channels, you'll find lots of resources, lists of channels, and what frequencies the dispatchers use. It's well worth the time and easy to program into your handheld using programming software on your computer, like my little Yaesu HT that ran the entire 2200 mile trip on just three AA batteries. There is one caveat I'd like to offer people intending to ride our U.S. passenger rail carriers about an interesting thing I discovered this winter while riding on the Texas Eagle line from Los Angeles to San Antonio and then north to Chicago. Our train stopped in El Paso, Texas for about an hour. I grabbed my cell phone to text my location to relatives and got a text message bounced back advising me I was accessing a Mexican cellular company. It said I should text back a particular code to avoid being billed at an astoundingly high rate. I didn't fall for that trick and my text was never sent, but the lesson learned is whenever you're near the U.S. border, be careful when using your cell phone or even your HT. You may have been switched to a foreign cell company with huge data and text rates without any warning. And in some areas along our border, transmitting on 2 meters or UHF may also not even be allowed. The El Paso train station is just a couple hundred feet from our border with Mexico. My best advice is to put your cell phone in airplane mode when you're near the Amtrak station in downtown El Paso, Texas. In our next episode, we'll cover using your HT on the train. I'm Greg Stoddard, KF9MP from Phoenix, Arizona, on the rails, reporting for This Week in Amateur Radio. We are This Week in Amateur Radio, your amateur radio and technology news magazine of the air, available as a podcast on iTunes, Google Play, and TuneIn.com. We'll hear about Bob Heil's ham radio roots. From the Minneapolis studio of the Radio Amateur Information Network, I'm Kent Peterson, KC0DGY, with a rain report that's both a little old and a little new. One of the pioneers of microphones for both amateur radio and the audio industry is Bob Heil, K9EID. Bob has been the manufacturer of high-quality microphones for amateur radio and the broadcast industry from his Marissa, Illinois facility near St. Louis since 1982. Bob is one of the real cheerleaders of ham radio, second only to Gordon West, WB6NOA. During the live town hall meeting at the 2004 Dayton Hamvention, Bob spoke about the enormous influence ham radio has had on his life since age 15. Like most of you, I got so infatuated with ham radio in those days. I'm 15 years old. My mama took me down to Walter Ash and bought this TBS 50D and the SX99. And my gracious, it's all of these wonderful things you heard. And then all of a sudden, I hear the most gosh awful signal. And it took me a long time to figure out what it was. Now, this is six meters in 1956. It was single sideband on six meters. And I finally figured out that it was K0DGE. Now he's on sideband, I'm on AM. Well, I was 50 miles from St. Louis. That was a pretty good trick to do ground wave in those days. Well, he was just blown away that I would take the patience and time to do this. I didn't know who this was on the other end. So every night at seven o'clock, we made a schedule and he'd be making 
making changes because he was building this six meter single sideband transmitter. And here I was on AM. Over the years of time, we got to meet. That person was K0DGE Larry Burroughs, the head engineer of CBS St. Louis. And so I became really, really involved. I thought, wow, this would be cool if he'd build this for me. So finally, one day, my mom dropped me off at the station. Well, he says, I'll help you, but I'm not building it for you. And he taught me how to build. I learned how to solder on the back halls of KMOX. You couldn't do that today. The unions wouldn't let you. But then it went from there to wherever. It just went nuts. I put up 128 elements in 1959. Bob Drake called me. He says, can you come here to our Dayton Hamvention and talk about that? I'm a 19-year-old kid. I didn't know what the heck I was doing. Here was Bill Halligan in one room, Wes Shum in another, downtown at the Biltmore, 600 people and I just absolutely centered my life around ham radio not knowing what an incredible institution it was because that was my college education it just went from there everything I did was based upon ham radio geography speaking skills just being able to talk to people. It was amazing what you do in a little town of 2,500 people. To really speed this up, I, I got involved in the rock and roll sound world, kind of a backwards deal. I was playing the pipe organ all those years. When I became a ham, I had already been at the Fox for a year and still playing word or pipe organs, but that's where I learned to listen. Listening is a mental process. It's an art. And I was very, very honored to be able to learn that art from tuning and voicing that word it's a pipe organ that's what gives me a lot of the credibility to be able to do what we do today how would I do it if it wasn't because of ham radio well let me tell you another little instance that's really wild I opened this little music shop I quit playing nightly I didn't know what I was gonna do I was teaching ham and organ you know all of a sudden this guy comes in and he's got this fender well, to me, I was out on my car. I didn't know what this thing was. It was an amplifier. I said, what's this? He said, well, this is a music shop. I said, well, uh, you know, we teach piano and Hammond organ. Well, I got this thing broken. I said, wait a minute, wait a minute. Being a ham, oh, wait a minute, you know. No was not in my vocabulary. I turn it around. It's got a pair of 6L6s and a 5U4. That was what was in my Harvey Wells, okay? So I said, well, what's wrong? Well, I knew what was wrong. He tried to make it go to 12, and it only went to 10. <laughs> he blew it up. The 5 u 4 was all gone. Turned the chassis upside down. Screen resistors were burnt. I put in a pair of 6L6s, changed the screen resistors. I had them in my junk box. Every ham has a junk box. You throw away nothing. And it wasn't a half an hour I had his amplifier going. This guy went crazy. He said, oh, wow. How did you know to do that? You didn't even have all them schematic things. No, I didn't need that. I was a ham. Well, then he went on to tell all of his buddies up in St. Louis, first thing you know, it's REO Speedwagon, and it's Michael McDonald. Now, these were kids. They weren't REO Speedwagon yet. They weren't Michael McDonald that you knew yet, but they all went to school around there. I became the guy, because I had a soldering iron. <laughs> to this day, I've never tasted beer or smoked a cigarette, and I've spent most of my life with some of the biggest drug addicts in the world. <laughs> However, I respected what they did. I didn't have anything to say about their personal life, but when it come to that stage, I owned it, because I had soldering iron. Jerry Garcia called me one day and says, hey, we've got all these speakers on the stage. I mean, we had seven semis full. I guess it was a lot. <laughs> How else do you get 50,000 watts of power? And who else but a silly ham would put 50,000 watts of power together on audio? We were the first. I didn't know that. I thought that's what she had to do. And so what did a ham do to get the speakers off the stage? I went and bought some Roan 25G. Jerry Garcia was thrilled to death. He didn't have speakers on the stage. I invite every one of you the next time you're at a concert to look up and tell me what you see. And every time you do that, 
It wasn't Bob Heil. It was ham radio that gave me the idea to be able to do these crazy things. And my life would not be even close to what it is. I'd still be playing a Hammond organ for 100 bucks a week in a Holiday Inn, trust me. And having a lot of fun at it. But I wouldn't have quite changed the world the way that we have. We got into this business 22 years ago because I didn't think things sounded right. The same reason I got into the audio world then. I thought, man, this stuff, I didn't like their music. I did, I'm playing Jesse Crawford, stuff of the 30s and 40s. But I respected what those kids did. They were talented. And I know you're going to say, well, yeah, they played those louds. Well, but they needed to do something with their sound, and we helped them with that. And so many things. The talk box that I invented, and we were the first guys to build the live console and all this. And, and, and to wrap it all up real quickly, uh, I got a call from the guys in Cleveland, and they said, we'd like for you to come up and go through the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. I thought, ooh, this would be cool. So I went there, and we had a meeting with the curator, and he started reeling off stuff he knew more about me than I did <laughs> like whoa how do you know that well you did this yeah you have that console yeah you were the first guy to do a modular power amp yeah uh-huh you, yeah, you have some of this stuff I said yeah this fall the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame is putting a display of Heil sound in their building <laughs> thank you I'm not here to get your applause. I certainly appreciate it. But please, before you did that, you should have given them a thought. That wasn't Bob Heil. That was the entire community of ham radio. It was that energy. It was whatever it is that drives me, that still drives me. It's that spirit spirit of ham radio it's still there for me what's really sad is that the newcomers to this hobby don't see or feel that spirit sometimes and that's the sad part if we had a thousand gordon wests and a thousand bill pasternak's a thousand dave bells all these guys that have the same type and more energy of me wonderful but we don't and that's what we have to go out and be the evangelist. I'm not just one of a kind. There's a lot of me out here. And it, I just wish the rest of them would come on forward and tell you what all ham radio has done for them. Because it's just amazing. And, and I really hope that you guys take this in the, the way that I say it to you. Because I'm not here to brag about anything. If anything gets bragged upon, it's this hobby. Because I wouldn't even have a clue of what's going on if it wasn't what I learned with that crazy Harvey Wells that still is on 3880 and 3885 every night. I still have it going. But anyway, we have a lot of fun and I hope that you guys can go out and help us create even more excitement because there's a lot more to do. We are This Week in Amateur Radio, your amateur radio and technology news magazine of the air. We heard a 2004 Dayton Hamvention talk by microphone pioneer Bob Heil, K9EID. Through the years, Bob has put his ham radio skills to good use, creating mega audio systems and technical gadgetry for rock and roll concert performers. Bob spoke about those early days in that 2004 talk. In 2014, Bob Heil gave a short keynote speech at the 2014 Pacificon, held this year in San Diego in early October. Thank you. Thank you very much. You have to remember, it all started with ham radio. Everything I know came from amateur radio. And I have to tell you what an incredible honor that happened when the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame came to me and wanted to know more about some of the history. And then when I showed them, I still had a lot of the pieces. They said, you kept some of this. I said, I'm a ham, we don't throw anything away. <laughs> I have had a very honorable and blessed life. And it all started because at the age of 15, my buddy in high school was uh, taking a ham radio test. So what's that all about? So I joined him and just magnificent things happened because of that. And I've met such incredible people through the way. And it's been my college education. When they did the display at the Rock Hall, they said, do you have any one thing that you'd like to do or show? And they had already picked out some of the magnificent things that had happened. And I said, but I have one request. What is that? 
And I said, when you do the signage, you make sure that you tell the public that my education was amateur radio. Amateur radio is in the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. Yeah. <laughs> I never forget it because I've worked in such magnificent studios and arenas with some of the great engineers of the world. And they're always asking me, well, what, what college did you go to? Where did you learn how to do this? Wow, this is fabulous. How did I, I, I just ham radio. No, no, no. Where did you go to college? Ham radio. What well, you don't understand. I said, no, you don't understand. Ham radio is the greatest educational thing in the world for technology because we aren't afraid to do anything. <laughs> As most things happen in my life, Joe Walsh was with the James Gang, and I was put there just a couple of years after I got into this crazy business, and we didn't know we were hams for a couple of weeks, and all of a sudden, we figured it out, and our relationship changed. You can't walk on a stage and move a microphone stand. You can't move a cable hardly. He and I, oh my goodness, right in the middle of a song, he'd come over and say, you ought to try to do this. Let's do that. Let's do that. And, and we were constantly, constantly changing things and experimenting. And that's what ham radio brought to us. And it continues to do that. I'm very blessed by all of this. And we continue today in new technologies, as we showed here, new technologies of a headphone. What do you mean technologies of a headphone a headphone? No, it's not. Paul Klipsch was the father of the hi-fi sound system of the hi-fi days back in the 40s and 50s. The man was a genius. In 1970, I got a phone call one day, and I picked the phone up, and he said, that you, Heil? And I said, yes, sir, who's this? Uh, there's a Clips here, and I'm going, Paul Clips? This is God on the other end of this phone. <laughs> I, what can I do for you? He said, you've got a guy who's got that 50,000 watt PA? And I said, yes, sir, I want to come and see it. He couldn't believe it. Nobody had done that yet. I didn't know that. I'm a ham. I was just doing what Walsh and I needed to do. And it was all because I wasn't afraid. That's what brought so many things to me. And now some of Paul's wonderful things he taught me about tuning speakers and the enclosures are now in our new headset. It's going to change the headset world. We've never had that before. And I never thought about doing it until a couple of years ago. It just one day, boom. My wonderful wife, Sarah, owns Heil Sound. I just invent stuff for her. <laughs> I'm very serious. She's an incredible business lady. She takes very good care of me. It's been a great relationship. But you think back about all of these things that happened in all of our lives, and you look back at a hundred years ago, what were we doing? Where was audio in those days? It was very, very poor. And as along into the 20s, a 10 watt amplifier was huge. It was a big deal. And then you came along with another ham radio guy that was going to Notre Dame. He watched the football team trying to practice. And Newt Rockney was screaming at them on top of his little tower. And they couldn't hear him. So this ham radio guy built a little amplifier. Of course it was tubes. And he built this thing and gave it to Newt and said, here. And he had this little speaker horn. And now Newt could talk to the football team while they were rehearsing and practicing. That guy was Al Kahn. Al Kahn went on to form a great company. He called it his electric voice. Al Kahn formed Electro Voice. Went on to own Tintech. He was a great, wonderful, powerful man in electronics. Where did he get his knowledge? Amateur radio. Art Collins. All of these guys, you think about all these great companies it all came because of their love 
of amateur radio. As we got into the hi-fi world, there were so many guys that got into it. We would not have Ampex tape recorders. We wouldn't have television because of all of the things that amateur radio brought into there. We don't think about their education. We don't really know where many of them went to school because we really don't care. It came from ham radio. <laughs> and we could be here all night citing examples. But even today, when you look at many of the software companies and all of the computer things, it was all because of ham radio. We wouldn't have an Apple computer. Think about that. The Apple computer, yes, yes, Steve Jobs was an incredible visionary marketer and all of that. But who built the Apple computer? It was Wozniak, and he is a ham. <laughs> These are things that we need to, to think about and base all of our goings on in the next hundred years in the fact that if it wasn't because of amateur radio, we wouldn't have many of these things. And I'm very proud to be a member of the ARRL. I've been a life member for a long time, <laughs> back in the 70s, I think, because we have to have some organization to keep us together or we have no direction. And this way we do have a direction but the main direction we have is one. I talk about it a lot when I talk to many clubs. I do a lot of club meetings these days. Clubs need programming. Clubs get dormant. Clubs are boring, many. So Gordon, George, myself, we do meetings via Skype. And we are really waking up a lot of clubs because now they have a purpose to come to a club meeting and we can teach things. And, and that, that's what we have to do today. We have to share this. And so many guys, I don't know why we aren't sharing it. You say, well, the kids don't come to meetings. Why? Because we're boring. Well, we don't have to be. We have the most exciting hobby on the planet. And you pick out which part you want. But it's all exciting. And uh, I love doing these club meetings because we're sharing what we learned the past 100 years. And if we don't continue that and keep these kids out there cooking on what we're doing, then we're going to lose it. We're not going to lose it. We're not going to lose it. Carol Perry is going to make sure of that. <laughs> yeah. All of us together, we need to continue this hobby, share it on, because this 100 years was a, a wonderful time for all of us. But we've got to make that next step and take it into the next century and make sure that amateur radio is as important then as it has been all through the past 100 years. I really appreciate you inviting me to be here. I had a wonderful time. What a great organization you have. And I really, really hope that all of us can make a lot from the next 100 years. Thanks very much, everybody. We'll see you on the air. And get on the air. Make those transmitters warm. That concludes our old and new look at Bob Heil, K9EID, founder of Heil Sound in 1982 and developer of audio technologies for concert venues and hams everywhere. Bob delivered this keynote speech in San Diego as part of Pacificon 2014 in October. I'm Kent Peterson, KC0DGY, bidding you a very 73. We are This Week in Amateur Radio, your amateur radio and technology news magazine of the air, available online at www.twiar.net. The ill-fated 3Y0Z de-expedition to Bouvet Island halted earlier this year because of poor weather and engine problems with its transportation vessel, will very likely not be rescheduled for the 2018-2019 Austral season, organizers say. 
it has become apparent that the chance of finding a suitable and affordable vessel for the 2018 to 2019 Austral season is becoming less and less likely, the team said in an April 26th news release. It appears that the very earliest we could mount a second attempt to activate Bouvet would be the 2019 to 2020 season or possibly beyond. The 3Y0 team reports that it has reached a fair settlement with transportation contractor DAP and has received a partial reimbursement of its payments. Our vessel Betanzos is now back in Punta Arenas and we believe that the container with our personal gear and equipment is intact. We will be arranging to transport the container back to the U.S. arriving in a few months. The 3Y0Z organizers say they want to offer prorated returns of the de-expedition funds in their account, although this will not happen until after the shipping container has arrived and the de-expedition has paid its bills and knows how much money will remain. This is going to be an enormous task with 137 DX clubs and foundations and 3,700 individual DXers, the announcement said. The process will take some time. We ask that you be patient as we complete this. The process to claim a refund has not yet been established at this point, but the 3Y0Z expedition team plans to offer a choice of a prorated refund or contributors may designate a foundation or club to receive the contribution. Any unclaimed refunds will be proportionally distributed to the major contributing foundations and the 3Y0 books will be closed. We are all unhappy and extremely disappointed that the project was not completed due to a mechanical failure of our vessel, the announcement said. This left the captain no choice but to abort the mission for safety reasons. Please accept our team's heartfelt thanks for your outstanding support of this project. China's twin-launch Chang-4 mission to the far side of the moon will place a pair of microsatellites in lunar orbit to test low-frequency radio astronomy and space-based interferometry. The two satellites, DLSPWA-1 and DLSWPA-2, discovering the sky at longest wavelengths pathfinder, are expected to launch in June. They'll carry amateur radio and educational payloads, but not a transponder. Equipped with low-frequency antennas and receivers, the astronomy objectives of the two spacecraft will be to observe the sky at the lower end of the electromagnetic spectrum, 1 megahertz to 30 megahertz, with the aim of learning about energetic phenomena from celestial sources. They will use the moon to shield them from radio emissions coming from the Earth. The microsatellites represent the first phase of Chang-4's mission. The satellites will piggyback on the Chang-4's relay package and will deploy into 200 by 9,000 kilometer lunar orbits. The mission involves placing a relay station in a halo orbit to facilitate communication with Chang's 4 lander and rover, which will be sent to the far side of the moon in December. Because the moon's far side never faces the Earth, the satellite is needed to serve as an Earth-Moon relay. Chang 4 mission will be the first ever attempt at a soft landing on the far side of the moon. The Military Auxiliary Radio System, or MARS, will sponsor the traditional military amateur radio communication tests to mark the 67th annual Armed Forces Day on Saturday, May 12th. Armed Forces Day is May 19th, but the AFD crossband military amateur radio event traditionally takes place one week earlier in order to avoid conflicting with Hamvention. Complete information, including military stations, modes, and frequencies, is available on the U.S. Army Mars website. The annual celebration is a unique opportunity to test two-way communication between radio amateurs and military stations authorized under Part 97.111 of the Amateur Service Rules. It features traditional military-to-amateur crossband SSB voice and CW practice using legacy interoperability waveforms and the opportunity for participating hams to utilize more modern military modes such as MIL-STD serial PSK and Automatic Link Establishment or ALE. Military stations and amateur radio stations are authorized to communicate directly on certain 60-meter interoperability channels. 
These tests give amateur radio operators and shortwave listeners a chance and a challenge to demonstrate individual technical skills in a tightly controlled exercise scenario and to receive recognition from the appropriate military radio station. QSL cards will be available for stations successfully contacting participating military stations. Military stations will transmit USB unless otherwise noted on the schedule on selected military frequencies and will announce the specific amateur frequencies they are monitoring. Mars stressed that frequencies used for the test will not impact any public or private communications and will not stray outside the confines of the exercise. An Armed Forces Day test message will be transmitted utilizing the military standard serial PSK waveform M110, followed by military standard serial STD wide shift FSK 850 Hertz RTTY as described in MIL STD 188-110AB. Technical information regarding these waveforms is available. The AFD test message will also be sent at 0300 UTC in CW. Those who want a QSL should complete the request form on the Mars website. Foundations of Amateur Radio In the past, I've talked about the standing wave ratio, the SWR, and how it describes some of the characteristics of your antenna system. I say system because it's not just the antenna. It's the connection between your radio and the antenna as well. The coax or feed line, their length and how you've connected your antenna all feature in the performance of the entire kit and caboodle. As an aside, that's why measuring an antenna with an SWR meter at the bottom of the antenna while you're bolting it to the top of your mast is likely to give you a different result when compared with the measurement performed at the radio. During the week, I was asked about how cutting an antenna changes the SWR. The question included a quote from the ARRL single band dipoles page which states, if you see that the SWR is getting lower as you move lower in frequency, your antenna is too long. Trim a couple of inches from each end and try again. The person asking the question, Phil, wanted to know why he was seeing a different behaviour. I've seen the same myself, and until I had the benefit of an antenna analyzer, it also made little sense to me. The reason it makes little sense becomes clear once you realise what assumptions you're working under. When you look for antennas online or when you buy one, often it comes with a lovely SWR graph. You'll see frequencies on the horizontal axis and SWR on the vertical axis. You'll likely see a lovely, mostly horizontal line with a dip downward at the frequency where you want to use this antenna. The assumption you will almost automatically make, I know I did for years, was that outside the graph the line continues on its merry way in both directions. That means that you're assuming that the SWR comes down in one place and the rest of the time it's high. If wishing made it so. With the benefit of an antenna analyzer, you can graph the whole HF spectrum and depending on the hardware, you might even be able to see VHF and UHF or higher. One thing you'll immediately see is that the SWR is all over the place. It's up and down, crazy lines across the whole spectrum. You'll find enormous highs and some very interesting lows along the way. It's one reason why I can use an antenna intended for the 10 meter band on the 2 meter band. When you're making an antenna, like a single band dipole, you might find yourself in a position where your antenna SWR is going up and down like a yo-yo around the frequency where you're wanting to be. The higher the frequency, the more likely that your trimming ends you in a different dip or a different high outside the one that you're actually looking for. One other comment. The ARRL quotes, which is talking about HF dipoles, states that you should remove a couple of inches from each end. Let's take that literally, two inches from each end. That's four inches in total. Let's call it 10 centimeters between friends. If you're trimming a dipole for 160 meters, you'll change the frequency by just over one kilohertz. But if you're doing this on six meters, then the same trimming will change the frequency by nearly one megahertz. And if you use that HF recommendation for 2 meters, the change is almost 6 megahertz. So trimming a couple of inches, as the ARRL suggests, will work for some dipoles on some frequencies, but might get you completely crazy results for other frequencies. Now you know, the SWR isn't high across everything except where you care, it's all over the place. And sometimes that helps, and sometimes it doesn't. I'm Ono, Victor Kilo 6, Foxtrot Lima, Alpha Bravo. 
You are listening to North America's premier amateur radio and technology news magazine of the air. We are This Week in Amateur Radio, distributed worldwide at TWIAR.net. Friday, May 18th is the deadline to submit nominations for ARRL's annual Philip J. McGann Memorial Silver Antenna Award. The award celebrates the efforts on the part of an individual ARRL member to boost awareness and understanding of amateur radio services and benefits to the public. The ARRL Public Relations Committee will recommend a winner, if any, to the ARRL Board of Directors, which will announce the award recipient at its July meeting. The award's namesake, journalist Philip K. McGann, WA2MBQ-SK, served as its first chairman of the ARRL's Public Relations Committee and helped reinvigorate the league's commitment to public relations. The McGann Award recognizes a radio amateur who has demonstrated success in amateur radio public relations and who best exemplifies McGann's volunteer spirit. Activities for which the McGann Award may be presented include efforts specifically directed at focusing the media's and the general public's attention on the value of amateur radio. This may include such traditional methods as generating media coverage for a specific event or non-such traditional methods as hosting a radio show or being an active public speaker. The award is given only to an individual who must be an ARRL member in good standing at the time of the nomination. The nominees must not be compensated for any public relations work involving amateur radio, including payment for articles, and may not be a current ARRL officer, director, vice director, paid staff member, or member of the selection committee. Check out the specific criteria for nomination and nomination form or contact ARRL Communications Manager Dave Isger, KC1JMX, to obtain a form. The names of past McGann Memorial Silver Antenna Award winners have been posted on the ARRL website. And finally this week, NASA and the Department of Energy's National Nuclear Security Administration have successfully demonstrated a new nuclear reactor power system that could enable long-duration crewed missions to the Moon, Mars, and destinations beyond. NASA announced the results of the demonstration called Kilopower Reactor Using Sterling Technology, or Krusty Experiment, during a news conference Wednesday at its Glenn Research Center in Cleveland. The kilopower experiment was conducted at the NNSA's Nevada National Security Site from November 2017 through March of this year. Safe, efficient, and plentiful energy will be the key to future robotic and human exploration, said Jim Reuter, NASA's acting associate administrator for the Space Technology Mission Directorate in Washington. I expect the kilopower project to be an essential part of lunar and Mars power architecture as they evolve. Kilopower is a small, lightweight fission power system capable of providing up to 10 kilowatts of electrical power, enough to run several average households continuously for at least 10 years. Four kilopower units would provide enough power to establish an outpost. According to Mark Gibson, lead kilopower engineer at Glenn, the pioneering power system is ideal for the moon, where power generation from sunlight is difficult because lunar nights are equivalent to 14 days on Earth. Kilopower gives us the ability to do much higher power missions and to explore the shadowed craters of the moon, said Gibson. When we start sending astronauts for long stays on the moon and to other planets, that's going to require a new class of power that we've never needed before. The prototype power system used a solid cast uranium-235 reactor core about the size of a paper towel roll. Passive sodium heat pipes transferred reactor heat to high-efficiency Stirling engines, which convert the heat to electricity. According to David Poston, the chief reactor designer at NNSA's Los Alamos National Laboratory, the purpose of the recent experiment in Nevada was twofold, to demonstrate that the system can create electricity with fission power and to show the system is stable and safe no matter what environment it encounters. We threw everything we could at this reactor in terms of nominal and off-normal operating scenarios and crusty passed with flying colors, said Poston. The kilopower team conducted the experiment in four phases. The first two phases, conducted without power, confirmed that each component of the system behaved as expected. During the third phase, the team increased power to heat the core incrementally before moving on to the final phase. 
The experiment culminated with a 28-hour full-power test that simulated a mission including reactor startup, ramp to full power, steady operation, and shutdown. Throughout the experiment, the team simulated power reduction, failed engines, and failed heat pipes, showing that the system could continue to operate and successfully handle multiple failures. We put the system through its paces, said Gibson. We understand the reactor very well, and the test provided that the system works the way we designed it to work, no matter what environment we exposed it to. The reactor performed very well. Such a demonstration could pave the way for future kilopower systems that power human outposts on the moon and Mars, including missions that rely on in situ resource utilization to produce local propellants and other materials. The kilopower project is led by Glenn in partnership with NASA's Marshall Space Flight Center in Huntsville, Alabama, and the NNSA, including its Los Alamos National Laboratory, Nevada National Security Site, and Y-12 National Security Complex. For more information about the Kilopower Project, including images and video, visit the NASA webpage. This Week in Amateur Radio is heard on nets and repeaters all across North America and around the world on great repeater systems like our flagship repeater, K2CT, on 145.19 MHz in New Scotland, New York, owned and operated by the Albany Amateur Radio Association. Many of the news and information items heard on This Week in Amateur Radio have been provided by the American Radio Relay League, the ARRL Letter, AMSAT, the Radio Amateurs of Canada, amateur radio newsletters from around the world, sources on the internet, and the packet bulletin board systems of the United States and Canada. This Week in Amateur Radio is produced by Community Video Associates Incorporated, a New York State nonprofit corporation. If you would like to become an affiliate, submit news items, send us comments about the weekly amateur radio bulletin service, or just to support us, please get in contact with us via our Facebook page. Just log into Facebook and search for the group This Week in Amateur Radio. You can also find us on Twitter at twitter.com slash TWIAR. For program audio, archives, and the latest amateur radio news, visit our website at TWIAR.net. This Week in Amateur Radio version 2.0 is produced and distributed under a Creative Commons non-commercial share-alike license. Now, for the staff of This Week in Amateur Radio, this is Jessica Bowen, KC2VWX, saying 73 until next week.